she co-wrote and co-produced a documentary, which if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it, called The Power of Community, How Cuba Survived Peak Oil. And I have been um, teaching environmental literature and talking about these converging factors of climate, energy, um, for many years, and I've never found one film that does what The Power of Community does. Um, and in that film, Megan and a group from um, Community Solutions from Yellow Springs, Ohio, um, traveled to Cuba and as researchers and as um, documentary producers, um, were there to see Cuba um, post-Soviet Union collapse. Um, as a communist country, Cuba was receiving much of its oil, agricultural supplies um, from the Soviet Union. And when that collapse occurred, suddenly they found themselves without, you know, 70 to 80 percent of those supplies. So they provide for the rest of the world a great model of how we can approach being sustainable um, post-peak oil, um, post-big agriculture, post-bigger-is-better culture. Um, so, and I met Megan in November at a conference that was based on energy, environment, and economy. And I was very impressed with just some of the ways that she um, looks at that future, which can sometimes be a little disconcerting, and puts it all in a what we can do kind of framework. So without um, further delay, uh, Megan Quinn Bachman. Thank you. Thank you, my, my lie. Thank you so much, Marianne. And thank you guys all for coming out. I've given some version of this talk about 100 times over the last six years. And I must say that you all are the recipients of one of my more hopeful talks because it happens to be spring. And it's a beautiful day outside. And the flowers are blooming. And so we have our hopeful trillium, snow trillium, springing up from the dead leaves as our cover image tonight. Much like the phoenix rising from the ashes, or in this case, a sustainable, healthy culture springing from what is a very dying and destructive culture, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So this will be hopeful. This will be empowering. We're also, um, after my talk, which will be about 45 minutes, I really hope you all stay because we'll be doing this really fun interactive activity in small groups to envision our future along many different possible scenarios. So despite this overwhelming hope that I'm fearful about the future, I'm fearful, fearful about the, the state of our planet, the fate of future generations. So I must admit I have that fear. And I want to honor and thank all of you for coming out because I feel it takes a lot of courage to come to something like this, to another grim environmental talk where you're going to be again faced with the bad news of what we're doing to the planet. But this is one of my favorite quotes about courage because it involves how we, how we take the fear that we have, which is okay, it's all right to be afraid, and use it for positive action. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the judgment that something else is more important than one's fear. The timid presume it's the lack of fear that allows the brave to act when the timid do not. But to take action when one is not afraid is easy. To refrain when afraid is also easy. But to take action regardless of fear is brave. So, we're going to go down the scary path before we get to solutions. Environmental talks always have the scare you and then mobilize you. So here we go into the scare, the scare you part. And if anybody needs to leave beforehand, now would be your time. OK, now you're here. The story of the collapse of civilizations, of overshooting our resources, of overusing and damaging our habitats that, that sustain us, this is a very common story throughout human history. The, Rome, the story of Rome, the story of the Mayans. This is the story of Easter Island, which you may be familiar with, a very, very popular one to look at because, first of all, it was an island, obviously very limited in its resources, and it was a fertile forest when the Polynesians arrived um, in, I believe, about uh, the fifth century. And they, what they did was they lived happily on this island for many, many generations. They uh, had a kind of competition over who could build these giant stone monuments, however, which was one of the reasons why they fell, is they were basically tearing down their forests so they could erect these giant monuments. It took a tremendous amount of wood to, 
to transport these giant, many ton stone statues and to erect them. And so they slowly deforested, they slowly destroyed the ecosystem, the species went extinct, the soil slipped away into the ocean. And I wonder, a few centuries before the end, if there were some people who th thought, you know, maybe, maybe what we're doing is not sustainable. Maybe we shouldn't be cutting down our forest, cutting down the very thing upon which we depend, the trees. But they didn't, and the story we all know is this island was completely deforested. Eventually, the last tree was cut down, and all of the people died out. But we do have, have this time, and we are the people, the doomsters, the Cassandras, whatever you want to call us, who are saying, we need to stop before it's too late. And this time, the island is the entire planet. We are truly at a point of crisis. My favorite definition of crisis comes from a man named Robert Hand. It's a moment in which the past has the least hold on the present, and the present has a maximum hold on the future. This quote is so inspiring to me because now, in this time of tremendous crisis, tremendous hardship, we really have an opportunity to change things, to change things for the better, to create a healthy relationship with our planet, to create a society and economy in which we're living and operating in harmony with nature, where we're actually maybe even leaving our planet better off than when we found it, instead of the current model, which is generation after generation leaving the planet more and more despoiled. But it's also um, a potential for taking us down a very dangerous and very dark future, which I'll talk about. Now, the future, as we have always imagined, was this techno-fix, techno-utopia future, and this is kind of from the, the 1950s popular mechanics kind of mentality that we'd all be in these flying cars. It was an era of huge abundance in our natural resources and fossil fuels. And we thought that these were just unlimited, that the supplies would go on forever and we would continue to grow and grow and grow. Today, the popular imagining of the future, you have seen in books like The Road and um, the, uh, what's that Will Smith movie that came out and uh, Mad Max, all of these kind of post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, the video game Fallout. We all have this kind of sense now that we're actually going more towards this just collapse and total ecological disaster. And I want us to hold, though, a new vision, a positive vision, a hopeful vision, that we can actually live in communities that are giving back to nature, that are living in a cyclical and and natural relationship, that we are living in communities where we interact with our neighbors, where we have strong economic inter, inter, inter exchanges, where we're taking care of each other, where we're growing each other's food, where we're supplying our own energy and all, meeting all of our needs and taking care of our habitats, which, which we know is what really fundamentally leads to our, to our survival. The story that, the way that I look at the human story is, it's an energy story. It is our ability to, to extract more energy from our environment and to grow consequently. But the energy curve went up very dramatically with the onset of the fossil fuel era and will drop equally as dramatically. So that looked at from a large historical perspective, what seems like normal to us will really just be a blip on the radar screen. This is US energy 1635 to 2000. Why I really love this chart is that you can see the tremendous amount of wood that we were using in the 19th century. I mean, we deforested the East Coast, the Midwest of this country. Ohio, they used to say that a squirrel could, could walk from one side to the other without touching the ground. And I think we have one several acre old growth forest stand left. I'm not sure how much is true about the deforestation of Michigan. Um, but even with all of that wood energy, we were only just a small, just really using not that much energy compared to what fossil fuels have given us, coal, then oil, then natural gas. So fossil fuels were really like winning the energy lottery. Here were these huge, immense underground stores of concentrated solar energy, basically from the sun shining on plants and animals over millions of years and concentrating into these dense, usable forms. This was really different because we, as humans, were only living off fluxes of energy, off of what the sun could, could grow in a year in, in plants and in, and in forests. 
So this was a tremendous shift in how we were relating with the planet. And this shows you just how much more energy we we're able to get from the fossil fuels. And energy is just really like the oxygen of industrial society. And like oxygen, it's invisible to us. We hardly notice it. But each one of us has the equivalent of 300 person power people working around the clock for each of us. Um, so if one BTU is equivalent to 635, um, one person power is equivalent to 635 BTUs per hour, it's like we have five times the number of people doing our work for us. Another way to think about it, one gallon of gasoline is equivalent to about six weeks of human labor. And we're paying, what, about $3 for that? Pretty tremendous. U.S. daily oil use is equivalent to 20 million years of person labor. So we just have this tremendous power at our fingertips, and we're not even really that aware of it. So as I was talking a little bit about history as energy, I like this chart because the black is showing really energy consumed, as the, consumed in the form of food is our, was our primary way of extracting more energy from our environment. And we developed you know, more, te more technological innovations like the plow that allowed us to greatly enhance how much energy and of course to greatly enhance the destruction we were doing to the planet. But again, that was more of a linear curve. We start to grow exponentially in the amount of energy we're consuming once we hit the fossil fuel era. As you can see, industrial man on the second tier from the top. I also like how this graph shows at the bottom here, you have um, the fact that this has not been equitable for everyone. In fact, 28% of the world's population consumes 77% of the resources, with more than 3 quarters of the world's population using less than a quarter. And this is growing more and more each year. It's not narrowing. The inequity is getting greater and greater. And actually, um, this is the case for real wealth, as well as this new era of financial wealth, which I'll talk about, which is making the, the gap between rich and, grow, poor, uh, rich and poor grow even more. And the startling fact that we're not told in school, on the TV, by our leader, government leaders in Washington, is that 93% of this energy, the sources that we rely on for our food, for our transportation, for our housing, will all be in decline in the next 25 years. We are faced with a clash of curves, and this is the most, this is the most complicated chart of the uh, presentation, I promise you. Just bear with me on this one. But it's really important to understand. This is world oil production. And oil is the best of our fossil fuels because it's liquid, meaning we can transport it. I mean, imagine if you had to shovel, your, shovel coal into your car. The amount of coal you would have to carry would be tremendous. Or natural gas, I mean, the, the tank, the size of the tank that you'd have to carry around with you would be totally impractical. But oil gave us the cheap transportation fuel that led to globalization and, and as its uh, use as a tremendous feedstock for so many industrial products. Plastics, of course, the most ubiquitous, but this carpeting is a petroleum product. The paint on the walls is a petroleum product. And oil will also be the first fossil fuel to deplete. Blue is the world oil discovery. And um, I don't know if I have a, I don't think I have a beam here, but it peaked in 1965. So that means no, in no year since 1965 have we discovered more oil than in that year. And this is despite all the advances and how we're able to find oil and the seismic 3D imaging and all the technology. Because we found the best stuff first. We found the largest oil fields. And now our discoveries are actually very minuscule. I mean, it'll be reported in the paper that we found this great new discovery, but it's actually really small. And discovery has been dwindling very rapidly. Um, and it's projected to, do, to go down, which it shows on the right side of that blue. Green is production. You can't produce what you, what you haven't discovered. So production has been going up steadily, rapidly at first, but it's been tapering off. And we're right about that peak. And I'll show you a little bit more on that. But then you have red, which is demand, which is always growing, especially from developing world, the de in the developing world but we're also continuing to, to increase our, our consumption demands. And we've created an economic system that is totally dependent upon increasing demand. Peak oil is really happening now. This is the last uh, few years. The inset at the upper left shows this plateau that we're really just basically barely able to keep up now with uh, increasing demands. And uh, the decline is projected when it comes to be on the order of 8 to 10%. 
So the plateau won't last forever, and we're ready, really in for some serious challenges. Says who? Well, pretty much everybody but the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Information Agency. But almost every other uh, government agency, oil companies are now admitting it. Um, Toyota's been admitting it for a long time. Government leaders, here are some, uh, a list of some things. Um, the U.S. Government Accounting Office did a great report on this. And just two days ago, from the, reported in The Guardian, the U.S. military did a big study. And they're actually warning of shortages, massive shortages, in oil by 2015. They talk about us running out of what's called spare capacity. So spare capacity is the amount between what's produced in the world and what's consumed. So typically there's a few million barrel per day cushion in there. But that's been shrinking and shrinking, and it's going to be gone by 2012. And by 2015, we're going to be demanding so much more than it's available, we're going to have shortages. And the military is concerned about it. So if the military is concerned about it, I think that we should be pretty concerned about it. 64 of the world's 98 oil producing nations are now in a state of decline, and country after country is following suit. The US, of course, peaked in 1970 in its oil production, and it's been declining since. In the 1950s, the US was not only the world's major oil producer, we were the world's number one oil exporter, exporting it all around the globe. Today, we're, of course, importing more than two-thirds of what we're consuming. That's our dependence on foreign oil that's led to a lot of uh, geopolitical and foreign policy decisions. But Russia has peaked. Uh, North Sea, in, uh, outs outside of the UK, a huge oil reservoir has peaked. And the world's remaining capacity, two-thirds of it, is in the Middle East, mostly Saudi Arabia and Iraq, in Venezuela, and in West Africa. But even in Saudi Arabia, they acknowledge that, you know what, this is a finite fuel. And in fact, they give us some sense of the time frame of how long it's going to last. It's a saying, my father rode a camel, I drive a car, my son flies a jet plane, his son will ride a camel. So future scenarios, that's what really tonight is all about, and that's what we're going to be working with later in the interactive exercise. Where are we going from all of this? This graph shows the industrial ascent, and it shows us four scenarios. The first is the techno-fantasy scenario that, you know, really, oil's not finite. Some even say um, we'll be able to just keep growing it. We'll be able to uh, just extract all of the, the tar sands and the oil shale and, and turn that into usable fuel. And um, the coal, we'll be able to do coal to liquids. And we'll, we're just going to find that the fossil fuel energy and keep on growing forever. The green tech stability is another popular scenario and a popular plan that's being put in place. That we can basically just replace all of our dirty fossil fueled technologies with green technologies and continue on pretty much business as usual. We won't keep growing maybe at the same rate, but we'll kind of just st go uh, become stable. The creative descent, earth stewardship, that acknowledging, you know what, we are at a point of really consuming way too much energy. There's nothing that's going to be able to allow us to keep consuming this much. Let's use what we have to build a sustainable infrastructure, a more localized infrastructure, and, um, and descend gently and, by, and taking care of each other and make sure there's no um, suffering and hardship at the time. And the red scenario is the crash that, you know what, we're, just, we're not going to be able to survive this. There's really no planning that can help us. Um, when oil's gone, we're just going to descend into chaos and anarchy and fighting over um, the world's remaining resources. Those are the four scenarios. No matter what, I think, by the end of this century, we'll look back on this time and think, what were we doing? <laughs> well, look, look, Ben, we can, as, just as we're looking at the Easter Islanders and say, God, wasn't that dumb? I think our children, grandchildren, maybe around the campfire will say, used to burn that stuff? What a waste. I mean, oil is such a valuable product for so many things. We make medicines out of it. We make thousands and thousands of products. And we're, put, we're, we're using it in Hummers. We're wasting it when, we, when we're, not, we're not stewarding this resource. OK, this is my final up and down curved chart of the night, I promise you. And this is per capita energy use. So this is different from the other ones. So what this shows is energy used per person in the United States from 1920 
2060. And what this shows you is the huge increase, the incline you see post-World War II to 1979. This was the golden era of capitalism. This was when a family could have one income and a house in the suburbs and a car and people were fine. That's all that they needed. Where appliance, new appliances that everybody was buying, it was the consumerist dream and we felt this was gonna go on forever. And actually since 1979, per capita energy use in the United States has been going down. It's been declining. I don't think it's a coincidence that real wealth, real income for people has been stagnating since that point. That people, we need now two jobs in a family to, to make ends meet. And what this is projecting is as oil production peaks and declines, that per capita is going to go right off this cliff. And that by 2030, our per capita energy use is going to be about what it was in 1930. So pretty rapidly. We're at a state of peak economy. This is oil and other liquids consumption in, in the pink. GDP, gross domestic product, is in the blue. Look at how they tracked. Our, our GDP, our economy, is based upon increasing energy use. That's how we've set it up. And so our economy, as we have currently structured and created it, will decline with energy. And uh, just to go back, because I didn't mention the other fossil fuels, natural gas will lag by about 10 years, and coal will be peaking by about the mid-century. So we really won't be able to use coal and natural gas to make it up for the declining oil. And natural gas, which is really more of a regional fuel because it's kind of hard to transport, um, it's, it's, having, uh, it's peaked in the United States and it's peaked in North America around 2000. And um, we'll start to have um, a natural gas crisis pretty soon as well. And I want to mention, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the economy because it's really fundamentally inter interrelated with these sustainable sustainability issues. GDP itself is kind of a silly measure because what GDP is measuring is the cost, not the benefit of our economic services. So when we try to maximize GDP, we're actually trying to maximize our costs. You may have heard the familiar uh, statements that if a forest falls, the GDP goes up. If somebody's diagnosed with cancer, the GDP goes up. If there's an oil spill, the GDP goes up because of all the cleanup that has to happen. So it's really not measuring quality of life, the benefits we're receiving. It's actually quite silly. So with peak economy, it actually might be a good thing. What the purple is is an indicator called the genuine progress indicator. And some people are putting it up as an alternative to the GDP. And there's many different alternatives that are being pr proposed. Um, the Kingdom of Bhutan has moved to the happiness index rather than GDP as a way to measure how their country is doing. And the GPI takes into account income distribution in a population, the inequity. It takes into account resource depletion. Rather than, using, rather than resource depletion being a good thing, it actually is a negative. It takes into account uh, crime and safety in communities. So it's a more of a holistic um, quality of life indicator. And um, as you can see, it's pretty much been stagnating, whereas we've had this incredible increase in wealth. The economy needs a planet. I assume if you've come to this presentation, this isn't something that I have to you know, hammer home. This is the Living Planet Index. A uh, measure from the World Wildlife Fund, and this shows that the health of our planet, this is measured by species health, species diversity, essentially the measure of ecosystem health, has declined by 30% in the last 30 years. Um, the statistics are everywhere. I'm not really going to repeat them about deforestation, which is happening. At, uh, happen we deforested the planet 10% in the 90s and have been going about 1% to 2% per year since then, since 2000. Um, you know, world fishery stocks are depleting rapidly, uh, soil erosion, um, the list goes on about all of the, uh, the challenges that we're having. Um, but we need an economy that actually is saying that the planet is important. That not that the planet is a subset or an externality of the economy, but uh, the, the economy is a subset of our planet. We are living in a situation on our planet where we're living beyond our means. We're overshooting our carrying capacity. And let me explain what that means. This graph on the left 
shows um, it goes to 100% and then it goes over to 140%. What this is showing is that we're no longer living off of nature's interest. We're depleting its capital. So every year, this is a measure of the productivity of the earth. You know, forests grow, uh, plants grow, the earth recycles wastes. It does all this thing. We it does all these things. And some say, well, that's that's taking care of all the damage that we're doing as humans. But actually, every year we're going over that amount by 40 percent. We're overshooting that, and so we're depleting what nature has built up over millions of years. The topsoil, for example, which you know in the Midwest was in some cases you know this this high, and of course we're down to these very skinny topsoils now. So we're depleting our planet's resources. On the right, this is a graphic from World Overshoot Day. So basically, they figure out what the Earth can 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 regenerate in a year, and where were we start in a year going over that amount. And this year it was September 25th, and it's creeping earlier and earlier every year. This is the fundament. This is fundamentally unsustainable. And this is one way that I look at sustainability. There's so many definitions, you know. Saving it for the future sounds so nice, but what does that really mean? And why aren't we actually doing it if you know, we have this definition? But we're really overshooting what the planet can support. And finally, a few things about climate change. I only have two charts on climate change because by this point I thought you might be getting a little bit depressed. So I'll go gentle on you here. Um, but we have a situation where we, we are changing the climate on which we as humans have developed. We don't know any other climate. We haven't lived here. And it might be OK, but it might be not. And it sound, seems pretty dangerous to me. This is the temperature anomaly, clearly getting warmer, especially in the northern latitudes. Let me just put this up. So uh, pre-industrial, pre -industrial, this is atmospheric CO2 concentration. Pre Pre-industrial, we are right there. Today, uh, in 2000, we are at about 400. And the worst scenarios put us up to 1,100 parts per million. This is just a dangerous experiment with the climate. We just don't know what this is going to do. But we have not experienced a, a planet like this. And uh, it's another difficult scenario in which to adapt um, to declining resources. And we've done all this, and for what? Has it been worth it? This is one of my favorite charts. It's a bit complicated. But what this shows is that the relationship between income and happiness isn't more income, we get happier. Now, it is up to a point. So what this shows is you know, if you're down here, uh, I think that's Moldova, Ukraine down there, where people are at about $1 to $2,000 per capita, uh, $2,000 per person per year income. That you know, if they go to four or five thousand dollars per year, that's going to cause a big jump in their happiness because they'll be able to get what they need. They'll be able to have some security. But as you can see, where the graph starts to level out, is that the relationship breaks down at about ten thousand dollars per person per year. So at ten thousand dollars per person per year, that's really all we need, and any increase in income doesn't correspond to a corresponding increase in happiness. And in the case of the US, which is all the way to the right, the highest income per capita, we're actually less happy than a lot of other countries, such as Iceland, Denmark, Netherlands, Switzerland, that are actually getting by with less. So we don't need all this money to be happy. And in some cases, the more, the more focus on materialism, the destruction of community, of safe places, the less leisure time that we have, less time with our families, that is making us less happy, the percentage of very happy people declining. Um, Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone talks about the decline of, of uh, community in America. There's no more bowling clubs and people getting together. People don't have time for it. The average American had three close friends in 1980 and now is down to two. And the number of people that have any close friends has doubled in that time period. So in many, in many ways, all of this, all of this focus on materialism, all of the energy that we've used to build this world around us has really not made us happier. We can't solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Albert Einstein, he really said we, we can. We actually, we can, but we shouldn't, I think. And I want to talk about how we are using the same kind of thinking with most of the solutions that are being proposed to these tremendous problems. 
Plan A. So I'm going to go through, again, the scenarios that I laid out at the beginning, techno fantasy, green tech stability, creative descent, and crash. This is the techno fantasy. This is the plan A. This is the dominant plan that's being put in place by government industry. And the plan is to extract the remaining fossil fuels, no matter the environmental or social costs, drilled offshore, drill Alaska, tar sands, oil shale, dig it all out. That technological innovation will overcome depletion that we don't have to worry, somehow we're going to figure this out. And for goodness sakes, don't change your lifestyle. Um, don't withdraw from the system. We'll take care of it. We'll solve the problem. And um, the new shiny box is that we can keep being consumerism. We can, we can keep be, being good consumerist Americans. Plan ener A energy, uh, mountaintop removal in the upper left-hand corner. Nuclear energy, coal, and this is tar sands in the right. The lifestyle, bigger, better, faster, bigger houses, bigger cars, bigger people. Plan B is the green techno fix, that we can have it all, that we can keep this going and we will just substitute out the fossil fuels with wind and solar, and that those will actually overcome the depletion concerns, that we'll have enough. Currently, they're only a, a per small percentage, uh, less than one-tenth of one percent is all the solar and wind in the United States, um, but somehow, before 2015, before the military says we'll have shortages, we'll have enough and in, we'll convert them to fuel somehow as well. That government and industry is again, again through their collaboration, going to solve the problem. The only thing we need to do is just buy green, just change our consumerist preferences. So large scale wind in the upper left, biofuels in the right, large solar projects like the ones going up in, in Africa to try to supply Europe's needs. And in the bottom is a rendition of a potential algal uh, algae field uh, biofuel project. And the mentality and the, the lifestyle is that, you know, pretty much our lives will, will continue as, as we imagine them, um, but we'll just have different sources of energy at the tap. And, you know, we might have to change our light bulbs, but that's about it. Okay, plan C, we're actually going to have to do about it, something about it. You know, we can't wait for government and industry. We can't wait for our leaders. In fact, they're not moving fast enough. We're going to have to change our lifestyles. We're going to have to change our culture, change our communities. We're going to have to live more locally. We're going to have to set up local economies where we're meeting each other's needs. And we're going to have to start conserving. And we're going to supplement that with wind and solar, smaller scale, maybe stuff that's more affordable for communities, solar hot, solar hot water systems, and fundamentally conservation, turning down the thermostat in this photo. And we're going to have to, you know, come together and live in community. It's a co-housing community. Um, and transportation is going to be more human-powered, bicycles, walking. And we're going to live closer to where we work and where we will have stores closer so we won't have to transport as much. And we're going to have fresh local food and we're going to garden together. Plan D, the final plan, the crash. You know what? There's way too many people on the planet. Uh, this, this peak oil thing, it's coming so hard and fast, there's nothing we can really do about it. Government's not going to be there. We need to start stockpiling guns and get the militias going and make sure that nobody steals our organic carrots from our backyard. Um, nobody really can do anything and um, let's all go drink. Mad Max here in the upper left hand corner, the, the road with the modern rendition and um, you know, it's just all going to collapse and there aren't going to be any, any people. And if there are, they're just going to be kind of scratching the dirt in the wilderness somewhere. If you couldn't tell by, I have a slight bias towards one of the four of these plans, uh, the Plan C vision. And I think that it can be done and that it must be done. And there is one model out there, as Marianne was talking about, Cuba. This is our film that we made about Cuba. Um, because when the Soviet Union collapsed, they lost half their oil overnight. And they survived, and they didn't kill each other. But it was hard. The GDP dropped by a third. The average Cuban lost 20 pounds. They really were only kept from starvation by government rations to every citizen. But they started coming together in their communities. They started working together. They identified land in their community that wasn't being used. They turned it into gardens. They transitioned their agricultural production to all organic. They started training oxen and, and leaving the tractors idle because they didn't have the fuel for them. They started developing biopesticides and biofertilizers, which they now export all around Latin America. They 
decentralized their energy systems. They did wind and solar in the rural areas that weren't even connected to the grid before. They developed mass transit options where they crammed 300 people in a uh, trailer, on a, on a truck trailer. And they were able to do this while maintaining high levels of health, education measures, social services were maintained. Um, so not only can we, can we get through the crisis, I think this shows that we can get through and be okay in terms of our quality of life. And the World Wildlife Fund in their Living Planet report said, really, Cuba's the only country in the world we can call sustainable because of the low resource use and because the high human development measures. Right now, 90% of Havana's vegetables are grown within the city limits. This is from a farmer's market, which have now been legalized in Cuba so that farmers can bring their stuff to market. And 80% of all uh, production of food is organic. They have more teachers and more doctors per capita than the US, about the same average lifespan. They actually have a lower infant mortality rate. And this using one-eighth the energy of the average American. So we don't need to be using this much, much energy. It's a waste. What to do? OK, there's a lot to do. And there's action that we need to take at all these levels, as individuals, as humans, as parents, as children, as brothers, sisters, as neighbors, as citizens of this country. There's a lot that we must do. But it starts with ourselves. Tomb of an Anglican bishop from Westminster Abbey in 1100 provides some good advice, I think. It says, when I was young and free and my imagin had, imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sights somewhat and decided to change only my country. But that, too, seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now, as I lie on my deathbed, I suddenly realize, if I had only changed myself first, then by example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would have then been able to better my country, and who knows, I may have even changed the world. I think it starts with us. I did a survey of about 2,000 people who are making the lifestyle changes that they see are needed, that are living the new way of living that we all need to move towards. And this is what they did. So this is not me telling you what you should do or you have to do. This is what people are doing. And if you want to follow suit, then feel free to. Reducing purchases is obviously, and, and um, buying more locally are the easiest things that we can do as American consumers. We just change our habits a little bit, and we can do that. And that's very important. Conservation measures in our home. This was, you know, taking shorter showers, turning that thermostat down uh, as, as much as we can survive in the winters. 68% of people are gardening. This is huge. I was totally shocked by this. More than two thirds of people see the importance of starting to take a hand in their own food production. And I think this is a really transformative change, and I think it's really important. Purchasing organically, walking, bicycling, reducing vehicle miles, reducing our, our household debt, very critical, though not necessarily connected to the energy crisis, as you can see. It was a lot harder to kind of build a new home, to go without a car in American society. It's really hard to get anywhere. It's hard to even imagine sometimes how we can survive without a car. Doing a deep run retrofit of our homes could save a lot of energy, but the cost is tremendous. Sharing a car, that's a tremendous challenge for Americans. Interestingly, my organization has a um, specification for a iPhone-based cart ride sharing uh, system where you basically walk outside the door and say, here's where I am here, here's where I want to ride, and somebody comes up and picks you up. And uh, we went and talked about this all over the country and world, and people said time and time again, women won't do it. It's not safe. And women were more than twice as likely to choose sharing a car in my scenario, interestingly enough. These are the early adopters, and I was really interested in what what motivated them to take these dramatic actions in their lives? Well, their conscience was number one. This is a personal thing. All, all the books and movies and media articles and presentations really aren't going to do it. This is something that everyone has to come to on their own. And I think um, you know, it's important to give that, but it's also important to realize this is, this is an internal process. Personal experiences, conversations, role models. Y y young people were much more motivated by conversations and by their conscience. Um, women were more. In, uh, were more um, motivated by their conscience and by personal experiences, men more by books and movies and media articles. And 17% of people reported that they quit their job and they did something else. 
So what did they do? Here are the top 10 new careers. Farming, number one, by far. A lot of people are going into farming. And you know what? We need a lot of farmers. In the US, we were a nation of farmers. And now we're down to just a few percent and a bunch of machines and a bunch of fuel. And we're going to need a lot more human labor in the new scenario. Um, activism and volunteering, not necessarily a career, but people are putting more of their time into it um, in these kinds of uh, organizations and getting people to live more sustainably. Renewable energy and energy auditing, auditing becoming renewable energy, energy engineers and inst installers, starting renewable energy companies, and energy auditing, measuring um, homes' energy use and helping people to cut uh, their energy use that way by retrofitting and by lifestyle changes. Um, people going into teaching some of these things. Small business, this was these kind of small um, entrepreneurial activities that people started up, like somebody started a local um, honey manufacturer or local maple syrup or a bike's bicycle repair shop. Permaculture design teaching a type of, it's a type of sustainable agricultural systems, sustainability counseling, uh, consulting, nonprofit sector, alternative health, healing with herbs and natural healing, um, and energy efficient building. I was also very interested, I know it's a lot of graphics, I'll go through them, um, in really what was keeping people from making changes. We, know, we all know this. And what hinders efforts in this bottom left-hand corner, not having enough information, that, was, that wasn't important. I mean, we are bombarded. We know what we need to do. We know intuitively that what we need to do to use less energy to live more sustainably. So what's getting in the way? Finances, number one. The lack of community, societal support, you know. There's only so much we can do as individuals. If we want to buy, uh, you know, local rabbit and there's no farm selling local rabbit and we've come up against a societal structure. Um, and so we need to work systemically, this is showing. Our own rid rigid habits and attitudes, we're just, we're so used to it. We've grown up, you know, just eating processed foods, you know, I just love frosted flakes, for example, you know, something, you know, we're just, we're so attached to that, and it's something that's hard to give up. The lack of support from our families, those closest to us. Um, the top left is showing what were the most difficult changes. Well, driving less was the most difficult, and that's a, that's a societal issue, because our infrastructure is totally built around the car in this country. Diet change was second, and again, that's a, that's a habitual thing that we've become really attached to. Some people thought really no change was hard. Conservation was also hard. Turning down that thermostat, being cold in the winter, people didn't like that. Um, why changes were hard? Again, cost coming at number one, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can address that. Habit and family. Family was, uh, you know, I, I need a car because I have to go drop my kid off at school, or, you know, my, my teenager just won't eat that tofu bake that I'm making for him. So all of these barriers. but. We're also, uh, the changes can also be made easy by some of these um, things, by the support of our family and friends when they, when they help us, when they work with us. Um, setting goals is something that's really important, that we can, don't, not expecting that, you know what, I'm going to be a 100% sustainable person by next year. I'm not going to use any energy. That's just not realistic. And, you know, we, we're all hypocrites. We're all going to be hypocrites for a while espousing these ideas and not fully being able to get rid of that car or give up those frosted flakes. But don't berate yourself. Set goals. Be realistic. Um, the support of the local community. People didn't really need to receive feedback on, on the kinds of energy that they were saving. Um, so that didn't seem to be important for, each other, for anybody. But why were changes easy? Because of the benefits that we're getting back. This can be a better life. I'm happier, you know, I'm r not running myself around so much. I'm able to spend more time with my family. I'm eating this great, fresh, local food. Um, the bottom right here, food was just the, the most benefit, this great, this fresh, delicious, delicious food that's more healthy for me. I feel better. It's more nutritious, I'm eating more vegetables and less processed food. Um, and at the, the top right, what were some of the benefits? General happiness and satisfaction, personal spiritual growth, get, learning new skills, um, a new diet, better health, saving money, not really that high for people. But these other benefits are more important. I thought that was really important. But we have to work together at that community level. We can't do this alone. David Corton says, in the world we want, the organization of economic life mimics healthy eco ecosystems that are locally rooted, highly adaptive, and self-reliant in food and energy. A lot of people talk about resilient communities, communities that are able to withstand shocks from the outside. 
you know, a hundred years ago, our communities basically produced the essentials. We grew our own energy in terms of in, in, in forests. We grew our own food. This was common thro throughout America. And we imported some of the, you know, some of the things like coffee and citrus fruits, things that, you know, basically the, some people call it the icing on the cake, whereas we really produced the cake. So if the icing went away, we still had the cake. We were still okay. Now we're doing the icing and we're importing the cake. We're importing the necessities and we're, you know, maybe adding a little value or, uh, you know, we're doing local beer. Well, maybe that's the cake for some people, but could be could be looked at as the icing too. Um, you know, all we're we're really not doing the necessities. We're just adding this this a added value to the stuff that we get in. Um, so being self-reliant in the essentials is really important for our communities to survive and to thrive into the future. And this is what relocalization is all about. And there's a global relocalization movement happening that's about producing what we consume and consuming what we produce. It's shifting our role as an American consumer where we're just consuming and instead saying we all have to take responsibility for producing as well what we need to survive as individuals, as households, as communities. And what this does is, it's economic, from an economic perspective, we're keeping the externalities in our communities. So, you know, if we all had a little coal-generating plant in our house and we had to breathe the fumes from that plant, well, we'd probably conserve. We probably wouldn't use so much because we're breathing the air, but instead we put those plants hundreds of miles away where we won't have to deal with the impact on them. So when we're dealing with those externalities, we're really living much more connected you know, we basically are in a, especially with globalization, you know, we are s connected with systems like sweatshop labor, which we're, you know, we're so disconnected from it that we don't even feel the, the damage that's done by it, but it's there. And if it was in our backyard, then I think we'd live a little differently. So we're moving from a more abstract economy to what is a more real economy an abstract economy that's based upon this distance. And this distance is only possible by the medium of money and by what has become symbolic wealth. Whereas the real economy is based upon local interactions with nature, with one another, by direct exchanges, not mediated through money as we've, dis as we've defined it. Money has no is no longer a medium of exchange. It has become a, a store of value that has been accumulated and by real wealth, and what real wealth is, as, the as is what I talk about on the bottom, it's skills, it's us, it's our neighbors, and it's our habitats, it's the earth. And the more community we have, the less we need this abstract symbolic wealth, and the more we can rely on our security comes from our own skills that we know how to take care of ourselves, how to grow our own food, how to make our own clothes, more on each other, in ha investing in the skills of our neighbors too, and more upon taking care of the habitats that take care of us. And monetary reform is really critical to this whole picture. Ellen Brown, who wrote a book called Web of Debt, says, we, are the, we the people have given away our sovereign money-making, money-creating power to private for-profit lending institutions, banks, including the Federal Reserve, which is not a US government entity, it is a private bank which have used it to siphon wealth from the productive economy. What they have done is created, when money is created through loans, the mo most money is created through loans, the money is created for the loan, for the debt, but it's not created to pay back that interest. So what's required is an economy that continually grows and at an ever-increasing rate so that interest can be paid back. Now, if the interest is not paid back, then the person forecloses, bank goes bankrupt, and the real, the real wealth of the economy, the actual assets, the person's home, land, goes up to the banks. So that's how they siphon the wealth from the productive economy and create a situation, a treadmill, where, which we'll never be able to get off of because we don't have the expanding resources that will allow our economy to grow. So we've created a debt system that is basically just siphoning money up and creating a more inequitable distribution of, pow of, of wealth and power. She says if we were to take that power back by in one, one uh, proposal is to create a state bank like the Bank of North Dakota, we could generate the credit we need to underwrite a whole cornucopia of projects that we don't even consider but because we think we lack the money. The wind projects, the solar projects, 
for retrofitting your home, for buying a hybrid car, for setting up community gardens and, community and, and larger uh, community farms that will be able to produce the staple crops, the calorie crops like grain and, and like rice. We could afford all that if we created our own money making, if we created our own money. There are five states now that have proposals to create a state bank. Michigan is one of them. And you have uh, the Lansing mayor, I'm going to mispronounce his name, it's v Berg or Vierg? Last name, anyone? The Lansing mayor, a, who's a Democratic gubernatorial candidate, is pushing this. And it's a great idea. And we'll keep, keep the money and the wealth of the state from going to large banks. Large banks who we've given hundreds of billions of dollars to and who aren't lending us money. And instead, it will allow us to have the credit that we need to build the sustainable infrastructure. This is really fundamental. And get us off of the treadmill and out of the cycle of needing more money to pay back the interest on the loans because they don't create the money for the interest. They only create the money for the debt. Now that I have bombarded you with all of this information, I want to leave you with just three things, <laughs> just in case you've forgotten everything, to take home. First thing, eat differently. It takes 10 calories of fossil fuel to create each calorie of food that we're eating. The average American is eating about a third more food than, in ne than we need per person. We are consuming twice as much meat per capita in the US as we did in 1960 and twice as much per capita than the developing world. And we don't need all that meat. And meat is highly energy, uh, 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 takes a lot of energy. We're eating 90% of the food that we're buying is highly processed food from supermarkets. And by eating fresh local vegetables, and vegetables on the left side of the list more than the right side of the list where we're currently eating um, will actually be healthier and um, happier and the planet will be too. Share a ride. For every single use, we're, we're driving with fewer and fewer people today. Hop in the car with a friend, it'll be funner anyway. And turn down your thermostat. There's lots of things, everybody knows the 100 things that you need to do to save energy in your home. It can be, become overwhelming for all these uses, but look at the top, home space heating's number one. So anything you can do to cut down that home heating will make a tremendous impact. Turning down the thermostat is a pretty cheap way to do it, and uh, maybe buying a few extra sweaters and blankets when you do that. Finally, the words of our book, Mr. Fuller, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I am fundamentally convinced that not only is this a necessary way to live sustainably in response to depleting energy resources in response to environmental degradation to climate changes. This is a better way to live. And I don't think this is something that we have to bash over people's heads. I think people will see us as happier, healthier, more satisfied people with great relationships, with a slower, more enjoyable life filled with valued people rather than valued possessions. And they'll see, I want that too. And I think it'll make the existing model obsolete. So, thank you, and um, please stay for this exercise. It'll be really fun, and uh, let me give you just a few uh, words on that. What we're going to do is going to break up into groups, plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. And the groups are going to come up with their vision for what the future looks like under that plan. So. Not you don't necessarily have to believe that that's the plan that we need to take. Maybe you do, that's fine. But what the logical progression from that kind of reaction to the current crises is going to take us. And I've listed seven areas over there to think in. What is energy going to look like? Where are we going to get our energy? And this is by 2050. Where are we going to get our food from? What's our food going to be like? What kind of food are we going to be eating? What's our housing going to be like? Where are we going to live? How are we going to live? How are we going to get around? What are we going to do for fun and for entertainment? What's our educational system going to be like? And what's healthcare going to be like? And you don't have to answer for any one of these. This is just a general guide. So, Marianne, if you'll orchestrate. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right.
right, well, um, and our cogitation's over uh, energy production. Well, plan A means we're gonna extract the remaining fossil fuel fuels um, without regard to environmental degradation. So we're gonna commission Chevron and, and, and all the big uh, oil companies to go at, at full force. And um, in, the, in the interim, we're gonna use, there's gonna be a government tax, let's suppose, where we can use that to develop an alternative such as fusion, and, and we were talking about Back to the Future, remember the DeLorean with Mr. Fusion? So <laughs> then we'll have all the, we'll perfect our cold fusion technique so we'll have prodigious, uh, virtually an unlimited amount of energy. So that's where we stand on, on energy in 2050. We're gonna, we're gonna use our technology and as we exhaust our remaining coal, oil, and, and uh, other fossil fuel reserves. Um, one of my Plan A colleagues suggested that um, healthcare um, would be uh, more affordable and um, less important because basically the human lifespan is going to be a lot shorter. <laughs> and it's, it's true, it's a trend right now. Actually, this current generation coming up is reported to live fewer years than, you know, people in their 50s and 60s now because of um, their poor nutritional habits. So, mm -hmm. so we're going to normalize, you know, a, a lower lifespan to maybe mid-50s to mid-60s. that sound about right? So therefore, we won't have pro uh, healthcare in general will go down because there will be more death due to acute illness rather than pro prolonging life through uh, heroic measures and life-sustaining uh, technologies in, in the future. We're opting for <laughs> a shorter lifespan. And of course, based on a world of great environmental degradation, you know, there will be less pleasant places to go and less reason to live <laughs> longer. <laughs> um, and um, food process. Um, we talked about larger factory farms because we're gonna be extracting as much fossil fuel and so we're gonna see a trend towards a larger um, factory type farms that are um, less agrarian type and more, you know, um, fewer farmers and larger uh, industrialized farms that use more equipment that run on, of course, the, more, the additional <laughs> fossil fuel that we're extracting until we mm -hmm. perfect the fusion combine. <laughs> nice. Um, Any more highlights from the others? Yeah. Well, um, just maybe a couple more and then just... Well, why don't we give... Okay. You're also planning. Yeah. We'd like to hear from you. <laughs> Well, okay. Um, basically, <laughs> well, since, I mean, if we are to kind of stay business as usual and keep doing everything that we're doing the same, um, we're going to be using more oil. And so by 2025, the amount of oil that we actually have is going to be significantly lower. Therefore, transportation, I mean, we wouldn't have as much transportation because people wouldn't be able to afford the amount of money that it's going to cost to even buy gas. So... Energy, we had a lot of fusion lovers in our group. There you go, guys, that was for you. Um, housing, what we kind of thought about was um, sort of government-run housing. Um, people wouldn't be able to afford the amount of money it would cost to just you know, heat their homes, so it would have to be low-income, um, subsidized housing. Um, as for entertainment, we, I mean, we mentioned a couple different things, but it just, I mean, I think a lot of people would be more apt to doing drugs. <laughs> I mean, things wouldn't really be going well, and so maybe they need to escape, if you will. Um, education, I, I mean, we didn't really touch on that one a whole lot, but I can't really imagine that, I mean, if we continue to, you know, to, to have the mentality that the government's going to solve the problem, then what really are we teaching our children? I mean, we don't have anything to teach because we are relying on a different source to solve all of our problems. Um, healthcare, we said it would dramatically go down because 
people would just be unhealthy. And so, I mean, just to produce antibiotics and to um, sustain hospitals, it would just, it, it, it wouldn't work. So, yeah, positive outlook. That's great. All right, plan A. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was all done. Of course, you have the fusion, which has been 50 years away, 20 years away for 50 years. We'll get there someday. My favorite's the fusion well, the combine. <laughs> fusion combine, all right. Okay, plan B. Thank you, Plan Ayers. I hope you don't go home distressed. So we're Plan B, and um, what we talked about is energy is, um, it's going to be very decentralized. Different regions of, um, you know, our country is going to have different sources of energy depending upon, you know, what's going to be the primary sources. It's going to be solar, wind, um, biomass. So it's going to really be dependent upon, you know, where people are living um, to see what kind of energy source they're going to have. Um, and what resources are available. Um, food, obviously, is going to be also dependent upon the energy that's available. Uh, also going to have to be probably more centralized um, just due to the, the lack of, um, of energy that we're going to be getting from fossil fuels at that point. Um, housing, uh, we talked about they're just going to be have to, or they're going to have to be a lot more efficient, um, a lot more um, active and passive solar technologies, um, and um, yeah, they're just going to have to be more efficient to be able to use less energy to maintain um, the temperatures that we desire and, and those types of things. Uh, transportation, uh, we kind of envisioned, you know, a lot of vehicles running. Uh, on electricity, or at least I kind of talked about that a lot. And um, but you know, of course, that electricity has to come from somewhere as well. So you know, we talked a little bit about you know where we get our electricity now, and where we would need to be getting our electricity at that point. Because um, for Plan B, we talked about our in Plan B, they said that it's just the only thing that's going to be changing is our energy source. So we're going to be getting you know not our not our actually demand for energy, but the energy source is just going to be different. Um, so uh, also along with transportation, we thought there would probably have to be some more uh, mass transit available. Uh, entertainment, um, that was a hard one. We, we kind of talked about, we wanted to go to, to see, we kept wanting to go to see, and we talked about um, <laughs> wanting to, you know, things to be more local and um, with, you know, less energy. Um, but if they're, you know, if we're still not changing our habits, but just changing our uh, energy sources, then they, I, I don't personally foresee any real changes in the entertainment. We have a solar-powered iPods. Yeah, solar-powered iPods and massive uh, amp, big theaters. You know, <laughs> um, education would definitely have to be tailored towards, um, you know, this new technology that's going to have to be implemented uh, in all the the fields that are going to be, I guess, in this transition to different energy sources. So, um, you know, more solar, more uh, wind technology. And I think all of that's going to come down to, uh, you know, trying to be as efficient as possible to be, be able to get as much energy out of um, these systems as possible. Um, what else do we say about the education? That's basically what we have down there. Um, in healthcare, we also talked about it's going to also have to be more local, and we even talked about you know having house calls and hmm. having actually doctors visiting the homes and things like that. So, cool. Yeah. All right, good job, Plan B. <laughs> Slipping to Plan C a little bit, but renewable energy is great. So, <laughs> well done. Maybe in the old <laughs> yeah, I heard the word efficiency in there, so a little more Plan C. All, All right, right, is this C? This is Plan, plan C. C. Okay. Um, our less is more plan. Um, for energy, we talked about solar powered um, for each home, panels on each home, so everybody would provide the small amount of electricity that they would use um, in their own home. Um, also, wind power um, would be used for um, like powering the grid. You know, there'd be like um, wind power like in farms, so they could multitask the use of the land use, where they'd be growing large areas, fields of corn. They could put wind power in with it with that. Um, here in Michigan, there's a lot of wind um, by Lake Michigan, so possibly harnessing that wind as well. 
Um, in the city areas, the more urban areas where there's less wind, they would rely more on solar energy. Um, also, solar water heaters to like um, provide that for, for um, each home and everybody for their hot, hot water needs. Um, we also talked about no nuclear energy. We just kind of decided it was our vision for the future, so we weren't going to have that. Mm -hmm. um, for food, um, we talked about more people would provide their own food, so there'd be more gardens. Um, rooftops would be utilized for gardening in the city, um, which would also cut energy costs for heating um, by keeping the buildings cooler. Um, there would be reduced um, meat, like we wouldn't eat as much meat, um, not like all together not eat meat, so you could still have a burger if you wanted that. Um, we would eliminate corporate livestock farms, like the corporations that go and treat animals really badly and then um, sell like the really um, processed meats and stuff like that. Um, we, in the gardens, we would vary crops so that the crops would not degrade the soil and um, it would be more sustainable that way. Um, there would be an increase in the number of farms and farmers. There would be smaller farms and there would be more farmers to work those farms. Um, for our housing, um, we would not have these gigantic um, houses that we see today. We would not have like these huge spaces that we would need energy to heat. So we would have smaller houses. Um, buildings that we have today would be converted to multi-use buildings so that we would have more things in one place, better use of our space. Um, we would reduce our energy needs in our housing. We'd find ways to insulate it um, and ways to cut down our energy needs. Um, uh, we, we would repurpose housing, so we'd take buildings, rather than destroying them, we would convert them to new uses. Um, homesteading and like government incentives for people to do that. Um, also to reduce energy, possibly some houses would be built underground or a portion of the house would be underground so that it would keep cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Um, for transportation, we talked about bicycles being used more often, people using livestock like horses and oxen for transportation or farming needs. Um, people would walk more in the cities, um, possibly using Segway scooters. I guess those are um, fairly energy efficient. Um, so if you had to go a little bit farther, you could use that. There'd be forms of mass transport available to people, so you'd be able to do that. Um, the Nissan Leaf electric car, I guess, is like kind of a new thing. It's a totally electric car, so we might use that. Um, but we'd need to find a way to solar, like a solar recharge, a way to recharge it with solar power. Um, for entertainment, we talked about plays, um, music, board games, kind of like family activities. There wouldn't be so many video games for entertainment, so kids wouldn't, wouldn't spend so much time doing that. You'd spend more face-to-face -face family time, talking, conversation, um, less reliance on electronic devices. Um, just more communication, more time with your family. Um, our education would have to have more um, closer schools, so a lot more of them closer to everybody's homes. There'd have to be more teachers, so there'd be more demand for that. Um, they would need to teach sust sustainability um, so that you know people could learn this and that they could <laughs> implement it for themselves. We'd have, like, for colleges, more online classes so that you wouldn't have to actually go into school. You could do it from home so you wouldn't have to have that transportation. Um, and then also, I don't know if this fits with education, but we said manufacturing for sustainability so that, like, computers and stuff would not be obsolete every two years. So, like, they could be manufactured so you wouldn't have to switch it out so often. Um, and then for healthcare, we talked about um, we'll just be more healthy in general. Like our lifestyle will change and so we won't have the demand for health care that we have today because we will be um, outside, we'll be in the sunshine, we'll have more exercise, um, we'll ha have a more healthy diet. Um, people will care more for each other so it'll be more like taking care of your family members, um, more taking care of your neighbors and then we'll also have more doctors than we do now. We'll train more doctors and more people um, for the health care, like taking care of people, so more people will be educated to be able to do it. So that was our plan C. Wow. Thank you. My goodness.
I could have given my presentation. That was fantastic. All right, plan D, last but not least. Should have planned this better, ending on the D note, but we can have plan C or plan D. All right, um, we had uh, plan D. There wasn't as much to talk about as the renewable energies and <laughs> the conservative of power and fossil fuels and whatnot. But um, for energy, we have uh, fossil fuels being depleted, um, utilizing whatever uh, nuclear or hydro hydrogen power that we still had in operation, maybe using static electricity. For food, um, <laughs> living off remnants of what's left, um, scavenging what's around. Um, cannibalism as the movie Alive. <laughs> Um, housing, living in dilapidated uh, remnants of houses, bridges, uh, canisters, whatever. Um, transportation, uh, riding in whatever is still usable, whatever is a makeshift, bikes, rollerblades, if there's any roads. Um, for entertainment, uh, looting, plundering, um, <laughs> your neighbor's uh, raiding parties. <laughs> kind of like Mad Max is what was discussed earlier. Um, education, oral stories like uh, old tribes of the Native Americans, I guess. Um, Health care, none, just basic survival. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Hmm. Thank you. Good. All those oral stories about all those oral stories about how we lived back around the era, the 2000s era, when we were living like kings. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. You did a great job envisioning, and I hope that you will join me on the path to Plan C and um, work together. And so thank you so much for coming out. Thank you so much to Marianne for inviting me here, bringing me to here to be with you. And I'm very impressed with what I've seen at GRCC, so keep up the good work. Have a good night.